We live in interesting times, don't we? I, I was reflecting a little bit, um, maybe it's an age thing, I don't know, but I just kind of think the last five or six years have been crazy. Crazy when you think about the kind of seismic events in our ex shared experience. Incredible things that we'll look back on as historic moments. Some of you will know that I'm a little bit obsessive about recording and making sure that I have a record of those historic moments. So I have a box labelled Newspapers of Key Importance that is confined to a cupboard that only uh, that Seuss doesn't ever want to see. Needless to say, that box of key importance has grown quite substantially over the last... I think there was, there was one moment where I was buying a newspaper every day because the cabinet ministers were changing every day. Or they, we had a new prime minister weekly, it seemed. We live in extraordinary times, don't we? And in many ways, it feels quite unstable. And with instability can come fear. But I believe what we need to be for our world is what the world needs is a church that is not paralysed by fear but propelled by love. We live in a world that needs love. Love is the antidote to fear. If you think about the things that are in our world, it is very clear that love is what the world needs. Not love shaped or defined by what the world might define, but a love shaped by the person that embodied love most profoundly, Jesus Christ. For the last few weeks, I've had this verse on my heart in Hebrews 12, and I believe it's for us as a church. What I want to talk about over the next few minutes is where we're at. What kind of church do we want to be? What kind of church do we want to be that is propelled by love and not paralysed by fear, but seeks not just to be a social club for those on the inn, but seeks to be something of good news for a world that is fearful? The writer to the Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. It's going to come up on the screen in a moment. Since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that, so, that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, the writer says, who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Church, we need to run the race marked out for us with perseverance. I believe that is what we are called to do. It's been a long time since I did any kind of running for any substantial time, but there was a time when I ran a couple of 10Ks in a row. And there's nothing quite like being able to see the finish line, albeit only 10Ks. I know there's some of you, even today, the London Marathon is on. There's people who have done far more extensive running than I ever have or will. But whether it's 10Ks, 5Ks, a walk down the street or the London Marathon, there's nothing quite like crossing that line. And when you see it, there's a new burst of energy that fills up through your muscles and your bones and you strive for that finish line because you can see it ahead. Something else kicks in that isn't there halfway through or three quarters of the way through. And in many ways, the writer to the Hebrews is picturing a race not unfamiliar to the kind of race that we would be used to. Only probably a bit less spandex. In fact, probably a bit less clothes altogether, actually. They were probably imagining a very different kind of race. And we find this image elsewhere in Philippians. We, we see this idea of the race 
being run. We see this image where the race is run. In Philippians 3, verse 12, it says, Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, Paul writes, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on on towards the goal. Life is like this race we are running. And the question is, what race are we running? We run this race as individuals in our journey of faith. This is what Paul is, the writer to the Hebrews is saying, and Paul says in Philippians. He says, what is that race you are running? But the question I want, to, I want to present to us as a congregation, us as a church, is are we race ready? Are we ready to run that race together? A year ago, we only just started meeting together regularly as a church after COVID. A year ago is when we started to see one another again regularly. A year ago, we were still, for the most part, wearing masks. We hadn't just yet encountered Omicron and the fear around Christmas and not being able to see relatives. That was less than a year ago. It feels light years away. We as a church had to come together again, to see the whites of one another's eyes again, to be human with one another again and not in front of a screen so often. We've experienced and encountered such a significant amount of change. As a, as a staff team, we, would, we, we saw in the early uh, or the later months of 2021, we saw significant staff members move on move on to new churches and new ministries. And so what we were embarked on was, if you like, a rebuild. And if you remember, those of you who were with us, we had this picture of that season as being like Noah's Ark, that we would all gather under one roof for a season, hunker down, look after one another. And if you remember on the similar Sunday this time last year, and people were asking, John, what is the vision for the church? And I stood up and I said, the vision is nothing. We're not going to do anything. And I was expecting this kind of, these frowns and these concerned looks because John lost his mind, kind of what on earth is, I thought he's the one who's meant to tell us what to do. And now the vision was nothing because I believe what God was calling us to was to, if you like, be on the ark for a season, bring the kids on site, bring them into, so we are shared together as one community, not have two services, but have one, to hunker down together, to look after each other and to prioritise the worship of Jesus. And that's all we did a year ago. We gathered on Sundays and we prayed and worshipped together once a month. And if you like, after the storm, if you like of Noah's Ark, we then began to look at what it looked like to rebuild. We did Alpha together as a church in January through to Easter. Online, in small groups across uh, town, it being live streamed in person here. We've seen our first baptisms here, people coming to faith for the first time. We've, seen, we've been able to celebrate baptisms here at St. Luke's this whole time. Gathering together under one roof, prioritizing the worship of Jesus. Coming together to, to learn uh, about who we are and what we believe as we do Alpha together. And then we began to explore the area of discipleship and that's what we've been doing with these streams and and so on. And I believe what God has been doing amongst us is making us race ready. You see, if you watch any athletics and a favourite for the race bombs out for whatever reason, you'll often hear an interviewer like this. 
they'll say something like, I wasn't quite race fit. Had a little bit of illness a couple of weeks ago and I've not quite recovered, or not quite shaken it. I was feeling really good a month ago, but it's, my form has just dipped. I wasn't race ready. I wasn't race fit. And I believe what God is calling us to do as a congregation is to be race fit. We're going to, over these next few months, explore what it looks like for us to church, for the next season of us to church. What is he calling us to? Not just this week or next, but for the long term. But in order for us to run that race very clearly as a congregation, we need to be race fit. We need to put the things in place that enable us to run well without pulling up with uh, any injuries or, or not being able to quite finish and cross the line. And I believe that we're going to be entering a season over this next uh, few months where we're going to be seeking the Lord as to what it is he's calling us to do. Jesus did the same thing. Jesus said, I only do what I see my father doing. He was only interested in one thing, what the Lord, his father, was asking him to do. He laid aside his agenda. He laid aside his priorities and said, my only priority is to seek the Lord and I will do what he gives me to do. I have an assignment for my Father in heaven and I'm going to make sure that I deliver. So why should it be any different from us? We should be people that seek after the voice of the Lord. One of those things that I believe that we're called to do is we're called to plant churches. You might look around and think, how on earth are we going to do that? Well, there's not many of us, but you know what? A church doesn't need many to begin. This church began with a handful of people in our living room 10 years ago. And on the shoulders of a few, we were asked to take on this building and to, to try and see this as a platform for what the Lord would want to do. I believe we're called to do the same. We like Lizzie. We like Lara. But actually, they're only here for a season because we're going to send them out we're going to send them out to plant a church and some of you will go with them not all of you please because I need some people here some of you will go with them and some of you will go with them with a passion in your heart to see others come to know Jesus and the reason we're invested in it is because we believe that planting churches is the most effective way of people coming to know the Jesus that we've just worshipped But we need to be race ready. We need to be ready to run that race. If we tried to run that race now, we would pull up halfway with a hamstring injury. We wouldn't cross the line. We, we'd hobble our way through it. We need to be race ready. We need to put the work in behind the scenes. We need to get the foundations right. Foundations of any building so often are the things that take the longest to invest in and yet they are the things that are never seen once the building is up. They're the things that if you get wrong, the whole thing gets messed up. They're the things, those foundations are the things that are the least glamorous, but they're the most necessary. That's the season I believe that we're in as a church to get the foundations right, to mix my metaphors and use a race and a building in the same sentence and to say that that's what we need to be doing to put the foundations right to make us race fit, to build something or rather, should I say, to allow Jesus to build something that will last. Jesus himself is the one that says, I will build my church. So what does it mean for us then as a church to invest in the foundations, to get ourselves race ready? Well, the first thing is that we are choosing constantly to remind ourselves that ultimately what, we, what the most important thing is when God's people get together is we worship. We worship and we pray. And when we've finished praying, we worship. And when we finish worshiping, we're praying. And when and you get the idea. If nothing else happens in the life of this church till the day that I die, and that's the only thing, that is all it is ever about. We can have all the activity and have all the busyness, but if we forget that, we may as well pack up and go home. 
It is about the worship of Jesus. The writer to the Hebrew says, keep your eyes fixed on him. So we have weekly prayer. 20 minutes doesn't sound like much, but 20 minutes before the kids go crazy, we need to take them to school or before we have to set off for work, join us on Zoom for 20 minutes and pray. Pray for our world that desperately needs an act of God in uncertain times. Pray for our community that they may know the love of Jesus. Pray for our church that we may be held by him and keep our eyes fixed on him. 20 minutes, come, pray, worship. Over the summer, we felt challenged as a team, not simply once a month to pray, uh, to worship rather for an hour, but to say, why aren't we setting aside hours to worship the Lord? Now, it doesn't mean we all have to do it. But I wonder what it would look like if we were a church where there was some form of worship happening 24-7. We're nowhere near that, but I wonder where not all of us are there 24-7 because it's impossible and we don't want to kind of be crushed by a burden. But what would it look like if we set a time aside to pray and to worship? What would it look like if a church was known for the worship of Jesus? So we set aside these three hours once a month at the moment to build that muscle, to strengthen that sense of who we are when we worship. And we gather here. And my dream is that we stop gathering here and we start gathering here because there's too many people. 6.30 to 9.30, come for 15 minutes. And if 15 minutes is your comfort zone, come for 20. And if an hour is your comfort zone, come for an hour and a half. But come and give priority to the worship of Jesus. I, I, I believe it already happens, but I would love it to be happening more. When people walk in, they say, there's something different about this place. And it's not because they get nice coffee. By the way, the coffee's been upgraded, just FYI. It's not just because they get nice coffee. It's not just because they get a smile, but they sense the presence of Jesus in this place because Jesus is present where his people worship. It's foundational to everything that we do. It's not lip service. So come and worship. Secondly, we prioritise one of the foundational elements is when we gather together on Sundays. To worship together on a Sunday. Often it's people's first experience of our church is worshipping on a Sunday. So we want to make Sunday a place where worship is prioritised for all ages. From our littlest that do the actions to our oldest that do the actions. As they worship in there and they worship over in our office space, the young people, we're all gathered together to, to worship, to, to, to prioritise the worshipping of God's people. Again, if this is simply a Sunday social club, let's pack up and go home. We want to prioritise it for all who walk in, from the youngest to the oldest. We want to prioritise another foundational element, which is our discipleship, our growth in our faith. And we talked about that a lot over the last few weeks. Where Alpha is the stepping stone onto a path of where we understand who we are and what we believe and who we are in Jesus and the person that we believe in him. Alpha is the stepping stone as already, as Lizzie talked about, got off to a flyer. But how much more would we love to welcome others into that space? Streams have got going, a place for us to plumb the depths of our faith. Disciples, we believe, lead to missionaries. See, we can talk all, the, all that we like about being a church that seeks for the good of our community. That is essentially the mission of God. The kingdom of God at work in word and action is through the work and hands and feet of you and I as missionaries. But that only happens when we are confident and growing in our own faith. We, we know, don't we, that if we feel close to God, we're more likely to want to bring someone else into that place. Our children and youth work discipleship is growing too. 
And you know what? I think we take it for granted that we have as many kids as young people in our church. We take it for granted. It is not the norm. I asked the guys on the team to give me some numbers to help me understand exactly what our kids and families' work is like. If you count individuals who are committed to our church family under the age of about 14, 15, and by commitment I mean like kind of once a month attendees, we have 43 children between the ages of 2 and 10. We have 17 under the age of 2. And we have 10 young people meeting at the moment in a youth group somewhere over there. 70 young people engaged in growing in their faith. And I'm sure I'm not alone that when I say that if people had not invested in me when I was a child or a young person, I would be not standing here today. I can think of two couples that invested in my life. And because of them, I'm standing here today. And I'm still worshipping Jesus, and I'm try still trying to serve him as best as I can. And we have 70 such young people in our church. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing, right? It's exciting. It's foundational. We're building foundations. The seeds that are sown of faith in these young people's lives, you will probably not see. But you don't know what they will grow into. It's foundational work. And finally, so we're prioritizing our worship and our prayer and our Sundays and our discipleship and we're prioritising as well, for some this is boring but fundamentally crucial, which is our operational side of things. We're trying to say, well, as things grow functionally, we need to work smarter. And anybody who knows me knows that that is not my skill set. Thank you. Anybody who knows, knows that admin is not a thing that I'm particularly good at or thriving. I miss people off email lists. I'm, I'm always screwing up these kind of things. We need to tighten up our operations. We need to get better at some of the more functional things. Our buildings and our facilities need to be fit for purpose. Our staff need to be kind of working together with different gifts to enable these things to happen so that we can see more of these things, that we can fan into flame the work that Jesus is doing amongst us. Our job is to do the work of fanning into flame that which God is doing amongst us. So that's what we're going to give ourselves to. The foundational things that we'll look back and go, what ever happened to those? But we know that they're there. They, they enable us to be race ready. But the other thing I felt like God say to us very clearly, stay in your lane. It's really tempting in the Christian walk to, walk, to try and run somebody else's race. To look over to our left or to our right and go, oh, I like what they're doing. Oh, I like what they're doing. I'm going to run that. Stay in your lane. Lane. The Lord has called you and you and you to particular things. Stay in your lane. But he's also called us to stay in our lane. We are not the church. We're a church. We're called to play our part in the coming of the kingdom of God. One life at a time. There are two prophetic words people have shared with me over the last few weeks, all relating to distractions. Don't allow ourselves to be distracted. It's easy to look at other churches or other things and think, or all the needs that are there out and about in our community and think, that's what we should be doing or that's what we should be doing. Stay focused. Run our lane. 
That's why it says in the, ver- in the passage, it says, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Everything that hinders can be simply the distractions of things that we shouldn't be getting involved in because it's not ours to get involved with. What is ours? And, allow, and trust God to do the rest with the rest. The world needs a church running its race. We have an economic crisis. We have a war in Europe. We have uh, uncertainty wherever we look. And like I said at the beginning, what the world needs is not a church paralyzed by fear, but propelled by love. But in order for us to run that race, we need to be race ready. And we need your help. This is not staffed. There's not the professional Christians and the amateur Christians. That doesn't exist. As soon as you said yes to Jesus, you signed up. And we need your help. If you want to be part of this, of making sure that our foundations are firm, then we need your help. And in particular, we need your help for Sundays. To be completely honest, Sundays are As they grow and as our kids' work grows, we need more people, not less. We need to create another space for our children over here because the two-year-olds are going crazy. As you can imagine, there's 17 of them or whatever there are of them, loads of them. And, And we need to create another space, but we can't do that properly and safely without the right number of volunteers. We need that. John and his team here and the worship team, they want to lead us in worship. But let me tell you, if you have a musical instrument, that you've maybe not played for a few years. Sign up, join him in that team, what he has there. Or indeed, if you can help with some of the techie stuff at the back, you don't have to be fully skilled. We'll do the training for you, sign you up at the back. But at the moment, there can be Sundays where John is both leading worship and doing the sound. And unless any of you have noticed otherwise, I don't believe he's omnipresent. We need everyone to pitch in. We would love to create as much of a welcome as possible for people coming in to say, welcome to our church. Let me help you get plugged in. But at the moment, we're kind of shuffling, if I'm honest, between somebody putting the coffee on, then leading the service, and and then going out to the kitchen. We we need everybody to to be part of it. Even if you've got children, do you know one of the best things you can do in in the growth of your faith of your children is to have them do it with you. Have them do, come and join me on the Connect team. Come and join me and pr- press all the buttons. My son Asa really, when he's able to, really loves doing the visuals at the back. He's like, I can do that. He can do it better than I can. Have your kids do it with you. The youth team, the kids team need more people. Invest in the lives of these young people. But above all, there is only one thing that really matters is that we fix our eyes on Jesus. To run our lane with all the other people that are following him also fixing our eyes on him. I'll finish with this story. Last Friday, Friday, I was um, in the city of London. I happened to have my dog collar on. I don't a clerical collar, just in case there's any amb- ambiguity there. Um, I wear my clerical collar, and um, uh, I was with a friend who was also had his clerical collar on, and we were just having a quiet coffee. We weren't being particularly evangelistic, and these two lads from Manchester who were on the, on a sales and marketing trip, they came up to us and said, all "Right, guys," we were like, "All right," and they were very clearly not interested in faith, except they were the ones that started the conversation. And one of them said this. He said, I just live for myself. I'm not that interested in other people. If people die in my life, oh well, he said. And he wasn't being crass or rude. He just was like, it is what it is. That's life. He said, it's all about business for me, he said. And I just thought, how much more do we need a church that is willing to say there is so much more to life than that? To live life without any hope 
or any sense of purpose. And church, that is what we are here to do. To run our race and to give people, as Peter says, a reason for the hope that we have. Under your seats, if you want to grab, there's a bit of a, there's a flyer underneath your seat. And I would love you to think about how you can serve on a Sunday. And as uh, Debbie and the team lead us in a song, uh, I just encourage you, maybe Debbie, if you could lead, lead the song over as people think and pray about where they can serve. And then there's banners across the church where you could help make this happen. If you think, oh, don't worry, someone else will do it, I guarantee you, we need you. In fact, the church is worse off without you. And if this is your place, this is your home, this is your community, we'd encourage you to think, could I serve once a month here in this church? And I know so many of you are already doing so in, in different ways. But if you could think once a month, I could give an hour extra of my Sunday to help make Sundays happen, that may be all that's needed.